So you were saying about Kim. What's going on with Kim? I think I seen her in the live chat. How are you doing, Kim? It's good to see you. Yeah, it's good to see you, Kim. I don't know. I Well, what I was saying is originally when I had interviewed Kim, a lot of people had questions and I never really got a chance to vet Kim. She was just a random, uh, she was just a random guest on my show. And mm -hmm. so I reached out to you and that's actually how we started talking is I was asking you how you knew Kim and just so I could have her back on my show and know a little bit more about her. And so I didn't know she'd be in the live chat because I haven't talked to her in a while, but I thought we'd show that video. And I have like three little, they're about like two or three minute clips I wanted to get your reaction to. She talks about a couple different topics. And uh, so I figured it'd be a good way to end our segment since we had about 15, 15 10, 15 minutes more to go. Yeah, so. yeah. Let's let's do this. <laughs> Steeler fan says, it's Pam. Pam? <laughs> oh, man, I'm so bad with names. That's funny. Pam. I, yeah, I called Kim Pam once. Long story, <laughs> long story short, um, I, I own a couple businesses, and one of my one of my customers or clients is is named Pam. And so I had just talked to Pam and Troy before I spoke with got on the show, and so I called her Pam, not thinking about it. And so um, well, I wasn't the only one. I came out on publicly buzz, and they called her Pam too. So I was like, you see, it's not just me. <laughs> But I'm bad with names. I hate it. But let's we watch start a new rumor. Oh, I do. It was a conspiracy across the world. I think people thought it, she was my wife. <laughs> I was like, man, you're crazy. Not 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 because like if anything like that, but like my wife's been on the show. Like you've seen her. You've heard her voice. Come on now. You know what I'm saying? So it's crazy. Yeah, I think you'd be a little more creative than your wife. too. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let me put this. I've got, so this first clip we're going to listen, it's just only a minute and a half, and then I'm going to skip forward because we kind mm -hmm. of, all right. Body is interesting. What he's been saying is so close to the info that I was given early on, with the exception of Ethan. I think I've seen his stuff. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Kim, thank you so much for coming on. It really like, isn't. Like I, well, it's fine. To, you, I don't care. Nobody has to believe me. I know that I'm not lying and want to be wrong with a lot of the things I've known. And I've said it for, I feel like the right reasons. Now, I should have done it differently, obviously, <laughs> but um, I didn't. And that's just where we are, right? That's just where, you know, I, you learn, unfortunately, you know, but at the end of the day, I think we all have the same goal. And- But it we, would be worse though, if you took what you know and just kept it to yourself. I mean, I think it's, you know, and that's true with everybody. I mean, that's why I think it's, you know, just a, because we, you know, we want to hear, hear everything so that we can process everything and figure out what's the most plausible, what's possible. And, right. and it was alarming to, to discover that time delay. Um, not that my daughter didn't tell me, I totally get it. I would have packed them up so lickety split they would have been home that day because we were there. It was parents weekend, right? We had been told, and that's likely why they didn't tell us any, and his parents at either school until later. Well, like like right before they they put out the um, mm -hmm. the shelter in place and then like within 10 minutes it was gone and it was, you're free to go, everybody's safe. I'm like, did they catch it? Like, and they didn't even catch, they hadn't even caught him. They couldn't tell us who, why, what, where. They can only tell us nothing and then, but they were safe, it was targeted or the house was targeted, which now it's, uh, and I'm going to pause right there because the story that she's telling, I mean, I don't want to, you know, obviously I don't want to play Kim's whole interview, but mm -hmm. just kind of telling the origins of what her story is. And for those who maybe don't know WSU mom, Kim, who are watching, she has a story about her daughter's Snapchats the morning uh, at 10 a.m. the morning of um, November 13th, 2022. And I'm just, I'm just. Uh, I wouldn't well, say that. All right. And so I got I have my, my interview with her recorded. And I think I think she's see see Kim's Kim's a great person. I don't think she's lying. Uh but and, and it very well could have been Snapchat, but she when Kim supposedly found this out. Well let me let me start off in the beginning. Uh when I said I vetted Kim, maybe I used the wrong term. I probably should have said I verified who she was. Right. 
So she is who she says she is. Her name is Kim. Uh, she has a daughter and a son that both attended WSU. Her daughter had a friend who was dating a person who attended the University of Idaho. And so all those things ended up being true, you know, and the way I figured and found those things out was, you know, she'd contact me on the show and she talked and said some things. And I said, yeah, you know, let's talk off air because some of the things um, are a little bit out there. And, you know, she gave me a name of the athlete that her daughter's best friend was dating or is dating. I don't know if there still are or not. Um, and she, well, she just gave me a first name, last initial, and she wasn't even sure about it. She gave me the name of her daughter and the name of her daughter's best friend. And so what I did was I went through the University of Idaho and I found a guy that I thought was the person that she was referring to. He fit the, what she had told me about him and the sports that he had played. And so I looked up him through his Facebook, which had been around since like 2014 or something like that. So it's not something new. And I found where he was in a relationship with somebody who had the same first name as the person that Kim stated that her daughter was friends with. Now, again, all I had was first names. I didn't even have last names at this point. And so um, I had Kim's last name because, well, she called the show and her last name came up on my caller ID. So I then went and I grabbed um, I went through that person's friends list and it didn't take very long and pictures to find Kim's daughter. And I was like, all right. And I clicked on Kim's daughter's profile. And sure enough, guess who her mom is? And all of these profiles were created and, and relationships were gotten into well before the murders, like years before. And so it's not like somebody created these fake profiles all of a sudden out of nowhere in 2022. I mean, some of them were as far dated back as like 2014 or 2016, 17, stuff like that is when they were created. And, and there's pictures there of family pictures throughout time with dates on them. So, yeah, I have no doubt whatsoever that Kim is Kim. Uh, her story, I, I'm, I'm not, I don't know how much of it is accurate. And I think one of the things that Kim did in my interview, which I appreciated so much, is that when Kim talked about certain speculation, we really tried to nail down the terminology where is this word on the street? Is this speculation? Is this something you read somewhere? Or is this something you heard directly from your contacts? And um, once she started breaking things down in that manner, really her story makes a lot more sense. And she explains where she has heard some of these things. But, um, and then, you know, as, as far as, um, as far as her accounts about the snapshot, at least we know she's done the right thing with that information. And we'll see. Right. We'll right. See and, I'm not, and I'm not saying that it's not true. I, I don't know. But when it comes to the information that Kim has. So what Kim had told me was that she was leaving Pullman when she got the uh, or she had already like left Pullman. They were a little bit of ways away, not too far away because they got the alert. They got the vandal alert to stay in place. This vandal alert was well after. Idaho University got their alert and Kim said that she called her called her daughter and told her hey you know I got this vandal alert and, and her daughter had said yeah yeah uh, you know um, we heard about that or whatever the case may be and they left it at that no times no places or who you heard it from or any of those things were ever discussed at that point I think she said it was like the next day or, or two days later uh, that she was talking to her and she and her daughter mentioned that she had heard it in the morning now, by this time, Snapchat had already disappeared. It had been over 24 hours. So there's no way that that Kim or her daughter, you know, could have gone back at that point. I mean, I'm sure you can go and download something. Maybe you can do that. I don't know. I don't know if she's done that, you know, and shown, hey, look, this is my daughter's Snapchat. This is November 13th, and this is when the messages started coming in. I, I don't know if she's done that or not, but at that moment... I don't think they had access to that. I'm, I'm not sure. But if it was deleted, she, Kim would have had no knowledge exactly what time it was. And from what I understand and from what she told me, neither did her daughter. She said, I don't know. I don't know. Sometime in the morning. And then she kept pressuring her and pressuring her. And I think it was over the span of a day or so that her daughter said, I don't know, somewhere around 1030. And so 
it wasn't something that she was looking back as far as a reference to and saying, oh, it was exactly 1030 or any of those type of things. It was her looking back saying it was in the morning. It was a Saturday morning. You know, Kim told me that her daughter and herself were out that night until very late in the early morning hours, you know, uh, themselves. So I don't think she's waking up bright and bushy till at 30, 9 o'clock in the morning. You know what I'm saying? If she'd been partying with her boyfriend and, and her friends and it was, you know, the last weekend of um, whatever, I think it was parents weekend. So there was some stuff going on. Um, but yeah, I, she said, I didn't say snap. But I think that, I didn't think that mattered. Yeah. And so I, I had told her, I was like, all right. So like, you know, she told me a bunch of stuff that was going on. And I was like, you know, the information that she has isn't like firsthand. It's, it's, it's a little bit of ways, right? Even, even if the information that she had was, was true at that point, majority of it was from her daughter's best friend's boyfriend. Right. So it's, it's not, it's not first person at all. And that's one of the things that I had been trying to explain a lot of times like that, that aspect of it is in first person. And you do have to put in the context that sometimes things get exaggerated when it goes from one person to the next, to the next, to the next. And so to me, what was important about what she was saying was the 1030, because her daughter is the one who said that that happened, that she saw that message. But I was never able to verify that it was actually seen. And so I can't tell you if that's true or not. The things that she says that a, I think a trooper or a state police officer may have told her, I don't know if that's true or not. And I do think that there's a possibility that if Kim was calling constantly asking for information and updates that maybe somebody lied to her and said, oh, yeah, we got all this and gave her a big story. Because I think they even told her, yeah, go go out there and tell the world about it. Go get on YouTube. That's not something an officer would say, especially if they had some pertinent information. You know, that sounds something like, yeah, like they really don't. They're trying to quiet her. Is the is the sense that I got from that, which I think was the wrong way of doing it, too, if that was what had happened. It's very much plausible that, that she was told the truth. I, I, I don't know. But based on the things that I've seen from the scene and her descriptions of what she says she's heard, uh, I wouldn't say that they're accurate. It, it's interesting. One thing that just stuck out to me with what you just said is in my interview, Kim said to me when she was talking about her son joining fraternity and calling the police after something that happened when he was getting initiated. She said to me that the police, she's a very protective mom, I'm paraphrasing, and the police know her voice probably at this point. So I can see why you, I, I can see why you're concluding and, and Kim has said that right from her mouth that she does, she was, you know, for protection of her kids, calling constantly after these incidences, trying to keep I would them. would have too. I mean, Brian Koberger didn't get arrested for seven weeks. So for seven weeks, almost two whole months, people that were in the area were living in fear that somebody could do that again. Right. You know, if you if you if your child was in one of those areas or very close, I, I think you would want to be checking in not only on them, but, you know, with the school and, and maybe even with law enforcement to try to figure out where the case is. You know, you, especially if you have kids who who are. Obviously, if they're in college, they're adult age, so you can't force them to leave. You get what I'm saying? So you can only do what you can do. And so I, I don't I don't I don't I don't falter for any of those things or and and I don't falter for some of the things that she said as far as what she's heard or people have told her. You know, a lot of the times uh, it, I, I felt more like the creator for going down the speculation avenue. I think it's weird when somebody asks somebody, what do you think happened and then castrates them for giving them an opinion? And says, oh, that's impossible or oh, this didn't happen or or you're saying this and trying to say that that's fact when you ask them for their thoughts and opinion, not for what you know. I would even take it a step further than that is when we have people on our show, we're so careful and helpful to them if they're not used to being on the podcast to saying allegedly or putting up a banner saying this is your opinion and I think mm -hmm. that you're right. If you're a creator and you hear some, the first thing you do when you read a piece of information is go find its source, see what you can do to verify it. And there's no difference in that when you're having an interview and following up with questions. Um, so yeah, I, I totally hear what you're saying. 
I mean, I don't even really think we need to play more of the interview. I certainly don't want to um, put Kim on the spot, but I really wanted your reaction to that because like I said, that was how I initially reached out to you and started conversation is making sure that the guest I had on my show, you know, that I understood everything about her and where she was coming from. And I do appreciate you taking the time to explain that to me and my audience, because it's probably one of the top three things that gets brought up to me when um, on my channel. So I just appreciate your clarification. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, you know, I've never, when I've talked to Kim, I've never um, thought that she was being deceptive or, or lying. I thought maybe perhaps it, she wasn't accurate in some of the things that she was saying. Maybe even her memory may have not been as accurate. You know, it happens to everybody. I've caught a, I've caught a three pound fish. I told one person, the next person, by the time I told five, it was like seven pounds. So and that's just coming from me. And so, like I said, I'm not saying that that was the case here either. I'm just saying that, you know, based on some of the things that I have seen as well, the crime scene, I wouldn't, um, I wouldn't say that what she's saying as far as some of the injuries and, and things is plausible. Well, mainly thanks. one thing that she's saying. Let me put it that way. Mainly one thing that she says um, is not plausible. Do you want to clear that one thing up right now, or do we all want to just assume? Um, I think she mentioned something about, uh, you know, the degree of the injury was so bad that maybe something was taken, like an, like an organ or something. And I, I don't think that's true at all. There, I don't see anything like that in, in, in what I've seen. Yeah. And I wonder too, and I never uh, got to finish my interview with Kim. I, I wonder too, if I was in the situation, she was telling me that I think I would have a question for Kim. Where did you hear that? Was that word on the street? Was that speculation from somebody at the scene? And, um, you know, I just wonder where she got that too. She um, told me that she got that from the trooper. So I don't know. And I, 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 I'm, I'm curious to know like how much information does that trooper have? You know what I mean? And so, the officer that she was assigned? Yeah, yeah, because, I mean, if you're assigned to taking tips, you're not assigned to any real importance of the case. You get what I'm saying? Like, they're, like, like how many tips did Payne look into from the 17,000? I, th I think he said none. He only looked at the, the, at the pertinent information, the pertinent evidence, stuff that matters. So if you're out there taking tips and phone calls about things that you may have heard or not heard, you're probably not high on that totem pole in this investigation. You can never so thought about like that. I never thought yeah, about that. How would they know about the, 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 the details of those things? I mean, yes, sure, some things get spread around or whatever between the department or whatnot. But the fact that very little is spread around about the truth of the case, like the fact that there was uh, like Bethany and Dylan were awake during the murders. Uh, I know that there was... Um, some people that had said that they were and that one person had seen somebody in a mask in the house at 4 a.m. Me and Blue and Hyman discarded it because we're like, dude, who's going to see somebody with a mask in the house and not call 911? And so, <laughs> you know, we went through all those things, too. You know, we had all those thoughts and, you know, we had to break it down and really think about it and put ourselves and talk to people who have put them who have been in those shoes, who have been in fear, who have. Um, been a victim of of home invasions. You know, we had one person call us that said that she was a victim of uh, two home invaders and she ran and she hid in her closet with her phone in her hand while she was in the closet hiding. Uh, she didn't call 911, didn't call 911. They eventually found her and assaulted her several times. And then when she was done, she called her friends. Or when they were done, she called her friends. She didn't call police. Her friends called police. And so those things happen and probably more often than you would think, especially with something like that traumatic, you know, going to a stranger and telling a stranger something you've never met before, something that traumatic probably isn't the first thing that people are thinking when something happens. So they're probably calling mom, dad, friends, anybody that they trust. Right. And so just because Hunter Johnson's the first person that showed up doesn't mean necessarily that they're the first person they called to. They could have attempted to call their parents or, or family members or whoever. And, and you know, we got to remember this is 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning uh, or Sunday morning after a uh, uh, or noon after after a Saturday night in college town. I mean, you know, people drink, people party, people sleep late on Sundays. So 
you know, it's a good, it's a highly possible that that's also how some of the things got spread around is because maybe they did call or text other people. And Hunter Johnson wasn't the first one. He was just the first one to arrive. You know what I mean? It's, I agree with you. 100% could have happened that way. Or even what I've come to think is if it was Hunter, you know, he did say at the service for life that he was Ethan's best friend and Santa's mm -hmm. father confirmed they had just redone the locks on the door. So I was thinking if they couldn't get in because there was a new code on the door or if they were locked in the room, Hunter Johnson is like the closest male who could maybe help break down that door with like a crowbar or, or brute force or something. I just figured since he was friends and he was close, he to get through that room if they were the first people discovered. Right. Well, we're also assuming that man Dylan or Bethany attempted to open that door. I'm not even sure they left their room until after Hunter got there. So, um, you know, they may have just called people because nobody's answering the phone and just don't want to leave their room. And then somebody gets there that they know, runs upstairs, you know, op gets the door open, says what's at, what's there. And that's why somebody faints at that moment versus any other moment. Because if somebody went up there and they try to open the door, if they looked in there and they saw the massacre that was there, they're not going to faint later. They're going to faint then. So if if she fainted, which from what I heard she did, that that part is accurate, that, that Bethany fainted, um, that's because that's the moment that what she feared became real. That moment would have happened already if she attempted to open that door. Right. The fact that it happened then tells me that she wasn't aware of the severity of everything until that moment. Now, could she have faked it? Maybe. I don't know. I'm sure that uh, paramedics got there and, and checked her, her vitals and things of that nature to determine, you know, certain things, if, if it was real or not. Um, Blue would be the person to ask that. But yeah, I mean, there's, like I said, that one lady who was assaulted when they broke into her home, like she wouldn't have left her closet if it wasn't for the fact that they found her. That was horrifying. Oh, yeah. right it is it is and and to hear like it, 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 she was a call in and she spoke about it and it was a uh it was very sad you know and, and heartbreaking to hear what she had to go through yeah well i'm glad there's people like you who chose to serve their communities and actually help people like that run towards danger instead of away from it so we thank you for serving yeah. your community you know thank you so and I've had such a good time. Thank you so much for showing up to our live stream today. Thank you for bringing Blue with you. That was a really nice treat to have him on panel tonight. Thank you. No problem. Richie Rich asked, Richie Rich asked where did I hear or read that Bethany fainted? Uh, I believe it was Steve that said that. And Banfield came out and said it too. So I don't know. Take that for what it is. From what I understand, it's very true. From what I understand is that um, Bethany was uh, the one that was like in super shock, like she couldn't talk, she couldn't say anything. And, and Dylan was trying to be helpful, but was speaking gibberish at first. Like they were just so in so much trauma. It took them a while to be able to talk about what happened. But I do know that by the end of the first day, by the end of November 13th, by about 10 o'clock at night, that police knew. Uh, the information that was in the probable cause that there was somebody in the house with a mask, 4 a.m., noises, things like that. Yeah, I think all we have are those early accounts before everything got gagged, sealed, and redacted, and we just don't have much more to go on. But yeah, I did hear that on Banfield too. And um, yeah, at trial, I think we'll have a a lot more understanding what happened that morning before the 911 was called and uh, we'll have a clearer picture. I, it's hard to make any judgment right now. I think we can't make any judgment right now because we really just don't know what happened. And Kim, what did you say? I actually truly believe Hunter J is innocent. Oh yeah. I mean, if you go watch the celebration of life and I told, I told everybody when we watched that mean blue and Hyman, I was like, dude, that guy's seen something that guy's seen something the way he's acting the way he doesn't look up the way he's just balling he's trying to hold it in together 
it's not he saw something that guy saw something and he's hurting a lot and that guy um he's a victim too you know he saw his best friend like that and you can just see how emotional that he was you know for people to say that kids that age are going to go in there and eat popcorn while somebody kills four people and they're just hanging around or having a meeting outside and then go watch go watch hunter j go watch him at the celebration of life somebody that actually saw the crime scene and you think that all these other people not one of them not one of them was had the heart and had emotion all of them were callous enough to say f this we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna eat popcorn. We're gonna have this meeting in the backyard, and we're gonna do all these things. And we're gonna clean up the scene, and nobody's gonna freak out. Nobody's gonna vent. Nobody's going to to have a mental breakdown. Even when Chief Fry himself also brought up the fact that trained police officers were having to seek psychological help after this. Does it really make sense that this was some frat kids? You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, so that's why, like, I, I get, you know, people tell me, yeah, keep an open mind or whatever. I, I get it. And, and I have. I'm, I'm open to something uh, that I haven't thought of or that we haven't spoken about. Because if it's if it's the same crap, if it's the ex-boyfriend, the fraternity, Brent Kopak, uh, I don't know, Chief Fry, everybody was transgender in the house. None of that makes sense. None of it makes sense. And you can deduce the information with just a little bit of common sense that those things didn't happen. And so show me something that is plausible. Maybe maybe Brian Koberger had an enemy. I mean, that's more than likely the case than, you know, some fraternity guy or ex-boyfriend does this and just so happens to have Brian Koberger's DNA on him and just so happens to know when he's driving around by himself and just so happens to do this when his phone is off and and just so happens to drive the same car. I mean, I think it'd be more believable if somebody didn't like him and they framed his ass that way, but it'd have to be somebody personal to him. It's not the police. You know, how, how are the police going to frame him? Like if they found the DNA sample or the DNA on the sheath and they turned it in and they submitted it into CODIS and that is in a national database. When did Idaho decide or University of Idaho decide to tell Moscow Police Department, you're taking too long, go blame this on anybody. And they go and find Brian Koberger and then they go and change what, the CODIS? They go in there and they manipulate the DNA sample so that it's Brian Koberger's and nobody can see that. FBI or any of these other law enforcement agencies that have access to this national database can see the manipulation of the CODIS uh, DNA sequence in there. So w- the other thing is maybe they went back in time and planted it then. It doesn't make any sense. Like, I, I understand you want a fairy tale and live in, you know, and I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about some of the things that I get told, you know, and, and you want to hear that maybe you know, this happened or that happened, but come come with something that's logical and reasonable. Those things don't make sense to me. 